leads to population and reproductive health. Uh, in this course, sociology mainly deals with, with how, how human beings interact, and the psychology mainly deals with, deals with the mind. Uh, we shall focus at uh, how social and psychological factors influence population dynamics. And uh, by talking to you, I hope you have also done some work in other questions. So when we talk about population dynamics, I hope I'm not using Japanese. Reproductive behaviors and then health outcomes. Of course, we look at how social cultural behavior and psychological issues shape reproductive health practices. Uh, for example, the number of children you produce, whether you are using contraceptive methods or not, and then how they finally shape or influence population trends in general. This course has objectives as outlined below. One, we will try to examine the key concepts and theories of sociology, psychology, especially those ones that are relevant to the field of population and reproductive health. We we'll look at social factors as well as psychological factors and how they shape population and reproductive health outcomes or behaviors. I hope you will also look at these courses, like when we talk about reproductive health outcomes, what are we meaning? When we talk about reproductive health behaviors, what are we meaning? I hope also those courses will be taught so that uh, you have a coherent kind of information. We look at approaches in those areas and uh, the main underlying limitations of those approaches. And then finally, we will apply sociological as well as psychological perspectives or theories to design, implement, and evaluate population and reproductive health interventions. Uh, the modules that you will cover are listed below, where we will have an introduction to the subject, psychology, sociology, and reproductive health. We will define the key concepts and provide the scope of sociology in the population and reproductive health. We will look at the historical perspectives and contributions of sociology, reproductive health, The relevance of sociological weight, this is running so fast. The relevance of sociological approaches in understanding population dynamics and reproductive behaviors. I uh, will have a focus at social institutions. Like the family is a social institution, the most important one. Other institutions like education, economic, and other government institutions. We look at sociological theories and models, including the functionalism, intersectionalism, theories by Marx, the so-called Marxism, feminism theories, and postmodernism. Uh, this course will also explore the social cultural determinants of reproductive health. 
where issues like cultural norms, values, and the practices, and how they impact family planning and reproductive health choices. Issues like gender laws will be explored, and emphasis will be laid on their influence on, on reproductive health decisions. Social determinants will also be explored. And then after exploring the social issues that affect reproductive health, we'll look at the other aspect of the course, which is psychology. And more or less, it will move in the same direction. We will have uh, a reflection on the definitions and, and scope, the relevance of psychology, very important psychological theories to the field of reproductive health will be explored. As I said, psychology refers to the mind, and you know, if to uh, put it in a lay understanding. And here we look at the cognitive factors that influence issues in reproductive health, like contraceptive use, and then decisions that take place in the field of reproductive health. I will explore the role of emotions, attitudes, and how they shape reproductive health behaviors. We will look at stress, fertility, and pregnancy outcomes. We we'll also have a reflection of fertility uh, uh, and family planning in different cultural contexts, including cross-cultural perspectives on fertility preference and family planning methods. We we'll also have uh, an understanding of the case studies of some of the family planning interventions that have been successful. We we'll also have uh, an uh, interrogation into the challenges and the cultural issues that are related to reproductive health service provision. Then the issue of gender, and then ROH will be explored in details. Understanding gender laws and power dynamics and how they relate to reproductive decision making. We we'll also have a reflection on gender inequality uh, since it's a very important issue in the field of population and productive health. And then, uh, yeah, kindly mute your microphone and you only leave, only leave the person communicating to do so. Uh, so these are references that we can refer to in order to replenish our understanding about the subject. So allow me share another screen. Unless one, uh, when, uh, unless when I have a question, John, do you have any question? No, we can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, only that from the middle there, the, my internet was interrupted, so that's why I was off a bit. That's why I was reconnected. Okay, very unfortunate. <laughs> uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. So uh, I said we'll start with an exploration of the concepts and also the scope of the subject. And this course is mainly handling two things and how they relate to ROH, that is sociology and psychology and how they shape the field of reproductive health. Uh, to start with the definition, Sociology is the process through which individuals acquire the skills, okay, the skills. I hope you are familiar with these concepts. The skills is like tangible things. Johnny, do you know how to dig?
Yes, John? Hello? Seems he's in a noisy place, maybe that's why it's not in his corner. It's maybe network, because he, even, uh, he has gone off. Oh, my goodness. You can proceed. So just proceed on the off. Yes, because yes, you can continue because because it's, uh, it's recorded. They can find the recorded uh, version. Okay, that's fine. So I was trying to say that socialization is the first through which individuals acquire skills. Like in Africa, you may not need to go to school to learn how to dig, and digging is a skill. Uh, you acquire knowledge, like speak your language, that is some bit of knowledge. You acquire values, societies have values, motives, and laws. Like it is mainly a family which teaches teach someone how to be a husband. So those are roles. Associated with the groups where they belong. You may be belonging to a particular tribe, so that is a group and you belong there. And the communities where they live. So uh, sociology is a fundamental process, very, very important process in human development because it shapes the way we behave. What you eat is a, a function of, 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 of the social interaction. Whom you identify with the identities is a function of the culture. So it is very important that it helps individuals to be aligned to their cultures, to their social environment, or even the society where they belong. It is a socialization that coins them there. And those are social groups, those are social institutions. Sociology is really a, a dynamic process <clears throat> where individuals are taught and trained in a number of issues, like some communities do circumcise their members. Okay, and they also train those who do the circumcision. So those are like norms, values. In Africa, we believe in our our religion is. I was talking about skills, attitudes. In Africa, we have things we don't we don't eat, we don't touch. So it is socialization that helps individuals to be coined that way. And we make sure that those behaviors. They may be uh, alien to, to none members, but they become appropriate that specific social group or institution or society. If socialization is about making someone social and fully human to the extent that they are able to participate in their cultural as well as social context. It is still through socialization where individuals learn their culture. They also get the expectation is they are, uh, they, uh, they are expected of, and it helps them to be guided uh, in their interactions and behavior. And at least I'm trying to explain each of these, like behaviors, the way we eat at times is within uh, the, the socialization. And look at where do we socialize, like in a family, that is a social institution, a clan, that is a social institution. So the behaviors at times we have are as a result of our interaction with those so-called social institutions. When does socialization start and when does it stop? We have said it is dynamic and it is more or less a life course process, right away from being infant up to when you become an adult 
independent person. So we are noting basically four stages. And these stages have also been recognized by, by psychology as a discipline. Like when you are still young, it is called the oral stage. Uh, much of the thing that you try to develop are related with your mouth. I hope people have the meaning of the word all. And then uh, shortly after you having only the mouth as the most important part of your body, there is the anal stage uh, where a child who is approaching from first year to second year of life is taught how to use the latrine. And you will find that uh, children at this point in psychology try to play a lot with their private parts because it is uh, a point at which children have a focus on their uh, anal parts. And the other stage is the already post stage that extends up to puberty as children identifies you with their family roles based on based on their sex. But then the fourth stage is adolescence. Aware at this point, individuals always struggle for their independence. They try to demonstrate that they can live on their own in terms of social socialization. What are the elements of socialization? Socialization basically has two elements. One, it is the process as an element of socialization. And when we talk about the process, we are basically referring to the method by which individuals adopt cultural norms and values. I hope you can also explore on your own what are the cultural norms if we talk about the cultural norms and what are the cultural values if we talk about cultural values, especially those are, are common in your communities in southern Sudan. Two, the second element of socialization is the outcome itself. Uh, assessing whether socialization was successful. For example, if it was about issues of belief, believing, uh, did somebody socialize very well the extent of believing the existence of God? And you know, in Africa, before, uh, before the coming of the, 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 the modern modernity, the so-called Western culture, we had our only culture, so people were, were, were inducted on what their religion was. And they, we had to believe the existence of God, just like even with the current religion. So in simple terms, the primary role of socialization is to shape character, behavior, and influencing both individual, well-being, and to maintain society. Uh, we have other two categories of socialization. When we talk about primary socialization versus secondary socialization. Primary socialization occurs early in life, during childhood and adolescence. And it forms the co-ident of individuals and focuses on regulating biological drives. Our primary socialization mainly happens in the family, with the introduction of education in schools and your peers can help in uh, developing this uh, initial component of socialization called the primary socialization in areas of life. And then secondary socialization after acquiring that at the initial stages, 
continue through your life. Like you adopt new groups, you have your worker means. Those are new groups. You adopt new laws, you become a husband, you become a head of an institution. Those are all some some extent social institutions because they influence interaction of, of humans. And this responds to acquiring social laws and responsibilities in adulthood. It occurs within the various contexts such as environments, as I've already mentioned, the working environments, and even in informal relationships. And even in formal relationships. Uh, also, we can look at socialization in terms of whether it is broad socialization or now socialization. With broad socialization, referring to independence, individualism, and expression of your own, your, yourself. And it results into so many potential outcomes. While well, uh, socialization modes obedience and conformity, and it uh, leads to a narrow range of outcomes, and we'll look at this in the next uh, presentation. Uh, socialization can be brought on within the various socializing forces, for example, in the family or with friends. Cultural factors also influence the degree of socialization with differences between what? Between genders. What are the characteristics of socialization? We have already mentioned that socialization starts from infancy when you were a child through your life course. And therefore, there is no doubt to mention that socialization is a lifelong process. We have also learned that socialization inculcates principles, values, and symbols of a social system. And it also enables individuals to enact laws. Examples of laws can be like a mother, father, those are laws. People are on the titles, but the laws that come with those titles. Laws reflect what has been learned through the process. And expression, it expresses an individual's social what? Social nature. Okay? Like for you from Southern Sudan, you may be able to uh, tell that this one is coming from Southern, uh, the Southern part of the country, the Northern part of the country. It participates or facilitates participation in social life and socialization also shapes communication within society. I hope we have different languages in, in Southern Sudan, including the Dinka and other languages. These are shaped by the socialization process as a common future of it. Uh, we can talk also about total institutions in socialization. And these are environments designed for re-socialization. Some of their characteristics are that all aspects of life are centralized and controlled. For example, all individuals are treated uniformly within the large cohorts. Uh, what do we mean by cohorts? For example, if you go in the prisons, you'll find people in the same uniforms. That is being treated equally and uniformly. They will eat the same kind of food. They will sleep in the same hall for those so-called institutions. And if you see that for an example of a prison, these total institutions have daily activities and are strictly scheduled. And they are there is always a sharp division between the supervisors and the participants. So if you have prison orders, you cannot say that you have equal rights. No. There is a clear a boundary between those supervisors and those prisoners who are participants in that institution, the total social institution. 
And uh, we have already mentioned, uh, we already mentioned examples here, including prisons, mental health facilities, those who have ever visited health facilities that handle mental problems, military boot camps. They aim at uh, facilitating a complete break with the past and re-socialize individuals. We have rehabilitation homes of the juveniles or younger children, all those are total institutions. And the other form of social institutions, the other form of institutions are the social institutions. And these are organized structures and systems that guide behavior, relationships, and cooperation among other people. A social institution is simplified interactions, provide predetermined roles, and maintain cultural stability and regulate behavior. Such institutions include schools. In overall, that schools have predetermined roles, you go to class, and then they maintain the stability of our culture because it is through these institutions like schools or families that our cultures are passed over and they are sustained. Uh, the other one is the family as an example also, and it is the smallest and the most important social institution in all nations, including Southern Sudan, for child rearing and enculturation, because it is where culture is inculcated into uh, the younger generation, or even passed over. And some of the characteristics of the family is that there is a close knit. Okay. Uh, we may have extended families, and there is some kind of strong kinship in those institutions. Family as a social institution has a number of functions and these look to be more or less obvious. None of the rest we may discuss about them. One, it is within a family that members get emotional support. Like if you are uh, examples are like when you lose your beloved one, it is always the family to give you support emotional. Some of you have children, family extends love to its members, love to the children, love to the wife, love to your whoever is in the family. Another role of the family as a social institution is child rearing and education. It is also in the family where socialization takes place and values are also passed on uh, uh, through families. It is in families where economic cooperation is achieved or acquired and also it is an important area where resource sharing is, do is done. The family also <laughs> provides a sense of belonging and identity. I know people on a number of functions when they stand up, they always want to first front the known words about their families. I'm coming from so and so's family. So it provides a sense of belonging and they identify, most of you like identifying with your families, which is its role. The families also provide the care and assistance in times of need. Uh, they are a, a, a vehicles of transmission of culture and generation knowledge. Cultures and generations have their specific knowledge and is through families. Uh, that is how these oh. attributes are transferred from one generation to another. talking about family, types of families. Here we'll talk about types of families, those that are known to you, but also those 
that seem to be emerging with evolution of a number of issues. One that is very well known uh, among uh, the general population is a family that consists of parents and they are biological or adopted children, typically consisting of the mother, father, and their offsprings, commonly known as a nuclear family. Commonly known as a nuclear family. And the other family that has more members, on top of the mother, the father, and their offspring, but also other relatives like grandparents, aunts, and uncles is the extended family. And this one provides a broader support network. The other type of the family is the single parent family. And it comprises of one adult and their dependent children. Uh, the family having only the father and the children and the children can be referred to as a single parent family. Or a family having only the mother and their children can be referred to as a single parent family. I tell most people separate for some for one reason or the other. Or the most formal term for separation would be divorce, which may be as a result of a number of factors or a function of choice. Another term, another type of family I would like to share with you is the so-called step family or blended. I wish you would uh, check for the meaning of these words, like a blended. Uh, this is when two people with children from previous relationship form a new family unit through marriage or cohabitation. Like if your wife goes away and then you marry another one, but you have children in that very family, then that family becomes a step family or a blended family. Because the lady taking care of those children may not be the actual biological mother. Or even a wife may come with her, her children to your home and you take care of them. And then that one also qualifies to be the category of blended or step family. It involves step siblings, in other words. A childless family, it consists of married or unmarried couple without children. It may be by choice that a, a family is childless or as a result of inability to produce the so-called infertility. And I hope you will be looking at causes of infertility in other questions. Uh, now we have this other type of family. I don't know whether it is allowed in a, in the southern Sudan. The same sex family. And I think this is common in the western world. I'm not sure whether the same sex family is legalized in a southern Sudan, but in Uganda, it is not acceptable to have the same sex family. Where couples of the same gender who may even decide to adopt children, live together. And uh, this particular type of family reflects the diverse family structures or the evolving nature of family structures. You may never know next time you have families of robots as time goes on. Uh, we have grandparent headed family, and this occurs when grandparents take on the primary caregiving role of their children. Uh, may be due to parental challenges. At times, even the parents may die. Uh, the other one is the foster, or you adopt children, referring it to foster or adoptive family, uh, which involves parents who care for children not biologically related to them. And that can provide loving homes to children in need. We also have communal or co-housing families. And this may refer to unrelated individuals or families who chose to live together and share responsibilities. And here are the main issues, community and cooperation. And uh, we also talk about empty nest family. And it occurs when a child, a parent's children have 
grown up and moved out of the family home and it may lead to a new focus on couples relationships. The other type of the family is the child parent family which may refer to single parents or couples raising children but choose not to marry. Okay? Couples may choose to raise children, but they are not married. So that one is referred to as child parent family. The other one is the traditional family, uh, which reflects the historical view of a family with a married mother, father, and their married children, in which is less common in contemporary society. After looking at the role of a family, there are also other social institutions, including religion. Religion plays a significant role in guiding behavior. I hope you know that. Uh, like, a, I think among the Christians, you may not be allowed to marry more than one wife. They offer comfort. These are the people who come and pray for us when we have issues. And they also offer explanation to what is not known. Then what are the functions of religion? One, it is for social control. Okay, it controls the way uh, uh, our, our behaviors evolve. Like Muslims, they are not allowed to eat pork. Uh, typical Christians are not allowed to be polygamous, so they control socially some behaviors. They are also responsible for personality development, uh, including uh, somebody who is disciplined at times, maybe as a result of issues related to religion. They offer explanation to what is not known like maybe death or what caused death and it is religion at times that may offer such explanations and it also promotes closeness and cooperation you know people who play from the same church may end up being so close and cooperating with one another other institutions are economic institutions which involve economic units industries and other units contributing to a nation's economic system. They focus on microeconomics, macroeconomics, and addressing uh, specific economic units and the economy as a whole. And the other issue that is responsible for socialization is the government. And uh, you realize that the government plays a pivotal role in resolving public conflicts. It does the enforcement of the rules and regulations for the welfare of the society. Government has mainly three branches. That is the executive, which is headed by the president and uh, his cabinet or ministers. We have the leg legislative, which is headed by the speaker and the members of the parliament or the Senate. And then the judicial branch, which is headed by the chief justice and the other members in the uh, justice system. What are the functions of government? It does the constituent and the ministerial functions, addressing order, okay? Like this is the uh, done by police, justice dispensed by the justice sector, and also public works, like the roads or even schools. 
then charity. Another concept important for this course is social norms. And uh, what do we mean by social norms? Social norms are basically unwritten rules and expectations that guide behavior in society. And this can be no, no formal, in the form of laws, or informal, in the uh, in form of customs. Like our traditional customers have their regulations, we are referring to norms. Don't eat X, but formal laws can. One, there is connection. As social structures, norms and cultural values are interconnected and mutual reinforcing. Okay, we need to explore what norms are, what cultural values are, and how they are, they are connected. Two, they have impacts. The social structures, the norms and values, collective relationship, individual and collective behaviors, beliefs and identities. And the three, they are responsible for causing change, especially social change uh, when they evolve or are a challenge. Understanding of social class, uh, what do we mean by social class? Social class refers to a hierarchical division of society based on socioeconomic factors yeah. such as income, wealth, education, and occupation. So you realize that societies have their own kind of classes. Like you may find people of more or less the same income levels trying to associate on the same pot of, of beer. And so are people of the same education you find them associating the same way. What are the characteristics of social class? It categorizes individuals or groups in this strata, all layers, with varying levels of privilege, power, and access to resources. Okay, just as I've mentioned, you may find people of more or less the same income trying to associate together, people working in the same organization trying to associate together. So those are like layers uh, that uh, categorize, that are used to categorize individuals into different social classes. And then the importance, social class plays a significant role in shaping life opportunities, behavior, and outcomes. Okay opportunities you know you can get opportunities through your social networks or using your social <laughs> peers using your social peers those you associate with interact with what are the factors that influence social class one is income I hope you realize that people are who are of the same social, uh, who are of the same income levels always interact in similar groups, and so more people have accumulated the assets, property, savings, etc. Also tend to belong to the same social class. 
people of the same education level as a factor, people who work uh, in the same environment are most likely to socialize more or less as peers. Uh, what are the categories of social classes? We may have the upper social class, which is made of people with, who have attained, who have made high level uh, uh, achievements in particular areas, for example, in social cultural aspects. The middle class, who may be next to the upper class, people with moderate income or moderate achievements. Uh, the working class, individuals who are engaged in manual or low skill labor, often with limited economic security, and the lower class, that is the lowest socioeconomic group, facing economic hardships. So these are basically, if you are to look uh, through what happens in your society, these are the major, major social classes that are common in our societies, from upper class lower class from those who earn and have a lot of wealth the lower class of people who are trying to face economic hardships to make ends meet but these classes upper middle working you find that these are dynamic classes so we may have movements across these classes and that one takes us to social mobility. And social mobility reverses the ability of individuals or families to move up or down the social class. For example, today you may be in the lower class where you are, and you are, you have the lowest socioeconomic status and move somewhere either upper class or middle class. So that is mobility. You can go up or down. Somebody who is very rich tomorrow can be some are with challenges. Uh, so that one doesn't provide a clear direction on whether up or down, you can gain where. However, we may have specific movements like upward mobility, where an individual uh, moves to a higher social class due to factors like education, maybe when you get an education, some education attainment, it is. It graduates you into another high level social class. However, it may not only be like that. Some people may move downwards, it's called downward mobility, where we see an individual declining in terms of the social class status. Often, due to there are some challenges, including economic setbacks, businesses may collapse, someone who had, was a bourgeoisie may get to the lower ranking classes when we talk about social class what are the effects of those social strata social classes one these classes can influence access to care especially health care the way you feed that is nutrition living conditions like your house and hence accounting for disparities in the field of health because ideally you have low economic, uh, you have low wages. Then how do you expect to access high quality health care? A low social class limits access to quality education. And so the educational attainment will be low. I hope uh, you, you know that people coming from poor households always tend to have low educational achievements. Then upper classes may have more influence in shaping policies and government decisions. I hope you know the, 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 big, the big gun is responsible for influencing decisions in, uh, in Southern Sudan. And social class can determine the networks and the connections individuals have, impacting job opportunities. I hope some of you bear witness that some of the jobs you have you have them because someone you know connected you to those uh, jobs. Social class also have another issue 
along which provides an entity for identification. And how does this happen? It can be through cultural capital, where you have the knowledge, skills, and the cultural uh, practices associated with that social class. Uh, social class may also be associated with stigma. Uh, some people may be given funny names, or they may be given names that are more or less biased and can affect our individuals perceive, are perceived and treated. And then social class is responsible for socialization, as influences social norms, values, and behaviors learned within communities. After realizing our social class can result into identity or identity problems, so how do we address how do we address social class inequality? Our governments and organizations can implement policies to reduce income inequality and provide social safety nets. Uh, what are the, some of the interventions that can be implemented in Southern Sudan to reduce income inequality? Reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. <laughs> Efforts to improve access to quality education can help mitigate social class disparities. Okay? Uh, like you realize that people who are rich take their children to schools with schools with good performance. So we can improve access to quality education and this will help to narrow the, 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 the gap between those social classes. <clears throat> we can also do social justice movements and advocacy work calling upon government, raise awareness to address social class discrimination. The other way of addressing social class inequality is program supporting job training and fire employment practices like if somebody was in a lower rank at his place of employment and gets training then it can help the person move upwards in terms of the social uh, what are the major theories and the frameworks in sociology one of the theories that will be the focus of this lecture is the functionalism theory. And this perspective explains a society as a consensual representation that society is a function of consensus. And from this theory, the key focus is, it emphasizes, it emphasizes shared norms and beliefs within society. And this theory emphasizes the importance of sustaining the, so, the entire social structure. Okay? Like he, uh, in the in the institution of a home, we have the fathers sustaining that structure. A functionalist views society as a system where each each part contributes to its stability and function. It does not uh, look what at at people who are not going to contribute side, they recognize each and every one everyone's role. Still the functionalist or the functional theory emphasizes the shared norms, shared norms and beliefs, and it understands its importance in creating social cohesion. Uh, 
Uh, the functionists also believe in maintaining social order, in maintaining social order to make sure that the society's well-being is achieved. So they appreciate the role of social order as a key component in ensuring the well-being of the entire society. Uh, the other important theory of our, that will be important for our reflection is called intellectualism. Uh, yes, Samuel. Yes, please. Yeah, my my.